Hi everyone and welcome back out to Harvest Hills Ranch. Today we're going to be taking a look at a nutrient that is only found in meat products and speak to why that nutrient is so important for mothers to be and ironically why they're not why this information isn't shared with them. We're also going to talk about the cardiovascular controversy around this particular nutrient and I'm even going to have some final words about how this can affect man's best friend. So not just you but also your pets. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Arlen Hill and I have a passion for all things nutrition and out here at Harvest Hills Ranch, we enjoy talking about how nutrition is associated with everything that we do here at the farm, how it affects you and your family and even the food choices that you finally decide to make and ultimately what that means to you and your long-term health. So today we're going to take a look at a nutrient known as taurine and taurine is an amino acid, so it's a, a component of proteins but it is only found in animal sources. Uh, it's very abundant in beef, but you're not going to find it in plant sources, which means that we have to make some considerations for it. Now, taurine is a, is a nutrient that when we start to look at its availability and how we as humans utilize that particular nutrient, it's typically thought of as a conditionally essential amino acid but this changes based on where we're at in life. And this goes back to the comments I made related to uh, a mother, mothers to be pregnancy, because when we start looking at the developing fetus, when we start looking at infants and children, this amino acid, this component of protein is what's called an essential amino acid. So it absolutely has to be in the diet. It's not able to be made in sufficient quantities at a young age to meet our metabolic needs. Now the question may come up, why is that even so important? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of which is that if we look at what it is that taurine does in development, we find that taurine is very critical for normal brain development. Uh, so much like we, what we often hear about for the, uh, for the fatty acid DHA, you also need an amino acid to promote to promote normal brain development here as well. Uh, it's also uh, necessary for muscle development and for liver function as well, normal liver development. So these are all things that if that amino acid is not there in sufficient quantities at an early age, those are going to be things that are likely not going to develop to the degree that they otherwise should. And again, why is that important? Well, that's not a nutrient. That taurine is not a nutrient that we're hearing anything about. It's not a nutrient that is on the list for mothers to be notified of. Uh, they're being told about DHA, uh, the omega-3 there. They're being told about B12, their iron, their folate. And not to say that these things aren't important, because clearly they are, but we also, also should be adding taurine to this conversation as well to make these mothers uh, aware of that. And also to emphasize that when you look at the, that spectrum of nutrients that I just mentioned there, all of those nutrients are available in, in beef and ruminant-based animals, those animals that are out there eating their natural forage and have a rumen uh, that's going to promote that fermentation process and the production of these particular nutrients. Uh, so that's important. Now, let's talk about one other aspect of this real quickly as it relates to this difference between animal sources and plant sources. And to illustrate this, uh, remember I said even when you're an adult, this is a conditionally essential amino acid. So what that means is that you are under most conditions not going to be able to make enough of this nutrient to meet your metabolic demands. And this has a significant uh, correlation to the difference between animals and plants and let me show you exactly how that plays out. So if you notice on this diagram what you're going to see is that we can ultimately start with methionine and cysteine and if we just follow the the path all the way around it leads us over here to taurine and we'll talk more about these bile salts and the excretion here momentarily but the thing I want you to note is that if methionine and cysteine are the starting blocks here for taurine, 
those are also two nutrients that are not in sufficient amounts of uh, uh, they're not in sufficient amounts in ana or in plant-based foods. So we need to take special attention to make sure that those are going in uh, as the precursors. But again, the synthesis is going to be limited in how you're producing those. So it just makes more sense to ultimately consume the end product there being the taurine. Now, I said I would talk more about uh, the role that this has in the bile salts. Now, let me let me preface this by saying is that what we should do here is we should draw a connection between how this protein component, this amino acid, how this affects our fat metabolism. And the way that this ultimately works is when we consume taurine, that taurine is going into the stomach it's uh, as a component of a bigger protein say some protein you consume as a part of your diet you break that down that taurine is ultimately going to bind with bile from the liver uh, and then once it binds with that bile in turn it is going to make what is known as a bile salt now these bile salts get stored up in the gallbladder and when you consume fat in your diet those bile salts are released and ultimately what they do is they take a large molecule of fat and they break it down to a smaller size through this process of emulsification and they get that that fat down to a small enough size to increase the surface area on it so where you can ultimately start to have the enzymes that are released from the pancreas specifically lipase here the enzyme that is specific for fat digestion the emulsification process makes that enzyme more effective now what does that ultimately mean for you well what that means is that when you look at the composition of fatty acids that you're taking in through your diet, you, you want those fatty acids to be broken down so you can assimilate those and in turn reincorporate those into different structures throughout your body. You also want to be able to have access to the nutrients that are associated there as well. So for example, your fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, all of those are going to be influenced by that taurine. So just to backtrack here for a minute, taurine allows you to make your bile salts that ultimately allows you to break down the fats that you're taking in and take in those specific fatty acids, the smaller components of those fats and the nutrients that are associated with them. So that amino acid has a direct impact on how you metabolize fats in your diet. Now, what else do we, what else do we need to know about taurine? Because again, this is a nutrient that if you are leaving beef and other animal-based proteins out of your diet, you're going to miss out on this. And I would even go as far as to say that if we don't consume an adequate quantity of these foods, we're missing out on the benefits of taurine as well. So we need to be able to take advantage of that. Now, one thing that I that I often think about, and this is probably where I clinically have the greatest association with taurine, is I think about it from a neurological perspective. And we'll see here that when we start looking at the application of taurine, I want to show you here just through uh, regulation. So taurine regulation uh, of the neuroendocrine function. And the important thing to note about this is when we start talking about taurine, taurine is actually going to be very critical in regulating the overall status of the, of the nervous system. You'll see here, here's another one where we're, where we're going deeper and starting to look at neurological disorders. But what I wanted to share with you on this is that many individuals struggle with anxiety and getting wound up, uh, having trouble slowing the mind down. We, we oftentimes think about this as being wired and tired, and some people aren't tired, they're just wired. But many of us have experienced that feeling where you go to lay down and you go try to go to sleep at night and you just can't fall asleep. And this is where taurine can step into the equation because where these that what's happening here is that if we think about the brain in regards of excitatory and inhibitory, those are the two states of the nervous system that we have to balance out. And if we become too dominant in either one, that's problematic. But most people find, just as a byproduct of various stressors, 
that they're more in an excitatory state. And so if we can have an intervention that is going to offset that, then that should yield some positive outcomes. Well, this is typically, this inhibition, the, the offsetting of this excitatory activity is typically driven by a compound called GABA. Well, what we know, and the reason taurine fits into this conversation, is because taurine is ultimately going to assist in stimulating the GABA receptors of the nervous system. And when you do that, now you've started to create the balance. The scales of balance begin to equal each other. And on one side of that scale, we have the excitatory activity. And on the other side of that scale, we have the inhibitory activity. And when those two are balancing each other, or or allowing each other just to ebb and flow a little bit. If one starts to elevate, the other can bring it back and check and vice versa. That's an ideal state of neurological health. And that's also where we start to think about longevity and preserving the activity of our nervous system into our later years of life because the nervous system can only handle so much excitatory activity on and on and on. Think about this in relation to stress. If we think about the effects of stress, the body's going to succumb to stress on many levels, and this is just another one that falls under that uh, under that scenario. So, point being on this, back to the main point of the conversation here is that we want adequate amounts of taurine, and to get adequate amounts of taurine means that you need to be thinking about what are the animal-based foods that are in your diet, and how what quantity of those are you getting, and if you can get beef and other ruminant animals that are going to have higher quantities of taurine, that needs to be a routine part of your diet as well, if that makes sense for you. And for most people, it does. What else do we need to talk about here? Well, it wouldn't be a good conversation for us to have if we didn't bring some controversy into the conversation. And let me, let me start with the position that is typically held as it relates to, to red meat. And that is, is that red meat is detrimental to health on a number of levels. It's detrimental to cardiovascular health, that it tends to exacerbate uh, metabolic syndrome conditions. And there's many, many problems with the conclusions that have been drawn from the studies that have, um, that have shown this. Uh, there's problems in regards to the uh, what appears to be a, an agenda and the propaganda around this, because when you really put the put the research to the test and you look at the true evidence it doesn't it doesn't equate to what you often hear as far as red meat being an increased risk factor for cardiovascular disease and especially when you start talking about this in regards to animals that are raised on their natural forest just like what we do out here at Harvest Hills Ranch we finish these animals on a mixed pasture of grasses and forbs and legumes and so they have high nutritional value meat the fatty acid compositions are going to be adequate and a lot of these um, whether it's these beneficial peptides like we're talking about today with taurine or whether it's other secondary compounds that are found in this meat source these are all going to offset the cardiovascular risk so let me show you something else here which really like I said, there's controversy in this because this is in opposition to everything you hear. And if taurine, which is coming from red meat, let me show you a few findings that I think you'll find interesting. And one, just right out of the gate here, out of uh, looking at experimental cardiology, a review here, this is showing that the potential, potential benefits of taurine in cardiovascular disease. Now, I do have more to show you with this because I, I want you to understand that mechanistically there are some mechanisms behind this that are founded we know what these mechanisms are so this isn't just theory that taurine has a benefit in cardiovascular disease no that's not what we're saying here we can actually point to the mechanisms by which carnitine is going to drive these improvements and so let me show these to you and so here's an here's a look at when we start talking about uh supplementation as it relates to uh, taurine, one of the things that we're going to see here is if we look at the some of these mechanisms here, you'll see that there's not one single mechanism in this. Uh, for example, adequate amounts of taurine, and this was done from a supplemental standpoint, not from a dietary standpoint, 
but adequate amounts of taurine are going to have an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, I will speak more to that momentarily because it's not just simply about reducing the inflammatory process and the secondary damage that comes along with that, but we know that this inflammation is a key component to cardiovascular disease. Uh, we also know that if you look at this second mechanism here, a decrease in hyperglycemia. So when those blood sugar levels are elevated, taurine can serve a beneficial role in bringing down elevated glucose levels. And it does it by improving the activity of the insulin releasing cells, which are known as the beta cells of the pancreas. And then you will see that there is a, an improvement in blood pressure as well. And there's a, there's a modulatory effect here that starts to happen on the angiotensin uh, renin systems. Um, the angiotensin converting enzyme is directly affected. And the conclusion that we ultimately draw from this is that there is an improvement in the overall cardiovascular picture when we start to see the improvement in blood pressure uh, specifically here when we start to look at the inclusion of taurine. And so there, there's a lot, when you start talking about this controversy, it doesn't make a lot of sense to villainize red meat when on the other hand you see that the ingredients, the, and that's not really the right word here, but the components, the constituents of that red meat in turn have the exact opposite effect of everything that we're told and so when we really are thinking well should i include red meat or should i should i avoid red meat as part of my diet guys you should be including red meat as part of your diet and this is just another this is by no means the only rationale for doing that but this is just another reason that we should be thinking about doing that now i want to throw in just a couple of other quick talking points about this and then i've got to tell you about man's best friend here because this is the icing on the cake this solidifies the viewpoint that we should have around taurine uh taurine also does a couple of other things uh if we talk about the mitochondria in the cell and this anti uh the antioxidant role that taurine has uh, i came across a unique illustration that i thought is certainly worth sharing with you here and you'll notice on this that when we start to look at the impact of the uh, of taurine as an as an antioxidant here, you'll notice in this particular illustration we have one, two, three, four, five different mechanisms by which taurine serves an antioxidative role as it relates to mitochondrial function. So it's key in mitochondrial activity and it's also critical in these antioxidant roles as well. So again, just something else to think about there. Uh, what else? So if you're looking at trying to regulate the different, uh, the water balance in the cell, we're trying to regulate the the create what's known as osmoregulation. It's basically fluid balance is all it is between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. Taurine serves a very critical role in that. Um, it, I mentioned the normal, the neurological development, but there's one other thing that I came across and honestly, I didn't realize this when I started looking at the research uh, and looking to bring this information to you. There was one other aspect of uh, of taurine that I thought was really unique and it all has to do with immune function and how taurine interacts with chlorine. Now chlorine chloride so let me show you this and I want to just uh, show you this molecule known as uh, N-chlorotaurine so very simplistically named but notice on this exactly what this does. And again, we're talking immune system function here. But notice this n chlorotaurine is activated by human granulocytes and monocytes. So those are when you, you know, if you've had a blood count done with your doctor, this is what we would think about as the neutrophils and the monocytes you do see on these tests. But taurine contributes to the killing of pathogenic bacteria, fungus, parasites, and viruses. So literally when we start talking about all of the microbes that we run the risk of encountering and that can be of detriment to our health, if we don't have good immune function, we can see how taurine, when it combines with chlorine, can start to step into the equation and can start to pick up some of that slack for us and have some inhibiting uh, activity of these different microbes to be able to overall protect us and be a vital role in our immune system. So like I said, that wasn't one that I was aware of, but I certainly think it's one that 
will resonate with me. And it's also in regards to thinking about as I'm looking at my food selection where, you know, we all have times where we feel that our immune system is starting to decline, where we feel run down. Uh, you know, you're all, we're always at some point going to have an immune system challenge, but this is another uh, tool that we can have, another arrow in the quiver when we make these dietary selections that are higher in taurine, these animal-based foods. This is another mechanism by which that can begin to overall support and build that immune system response. Now, I did say that I was going to talk about man's best friend. This is the third time that I've mentioned this, but let me delve into this because I know if you guys are anything like us, we really enjoy our our uh, our animals here at Harvest Hills Ranch. We especially enjoy the dogs. And notice on this one, this was a study that showed taurine deficiency and dilated cardiomyopathy in golden retrievers fed commercial diet. So the first question you should immediately have on this is, what was in the commercial diet? Well, in this commercial diet, it was predominantly grains and legumes. And if you've looked at a label of dog food recently, you'll realize that that is predominantly the ingredients. That is usually in the first two to three ingredients that are often found in these foods. And so it, the cardiomyopathy, what was shown is that when these golden retrievers when they were eating this diet, they were actually seeing an increase. They were seeing problem, problems with cardiomyopathy, and they went further and switched the animals back and started feeding them more of their um, evolutionary diet, which is a meat-based diet. Have you looked at the teeth of dogs lately? They're canines, right? So they're meant for ripping and tearing. And ultimately what they found is that these cardiomyopathy uh, this cardiomyopathy started to regress when these animals went back to their evolutionary diet. No wonder we have our animals here on a raw foods diet. We interestingly don't feed them as much as we did uh, prior. And what we found is that they're, they're actually much healthier than they were before. Uh, I have a 10 year old dog and when she went to a car or when she went to her raw carnivore diet, uh, she actually got a lot more energetic and many times now she acts very puppyish and we noticed that that timing coincided with the transition in her diet. So what are the conclusions from today's conversation? Well, one, if you can feed your animals a raw diet. Uh, when it comes to your, your cats and your dogs, uh, they're certainly going to benefit more. But what about us as humans? Well, in short, what this conversation today comes down to is that when we look at taurine, there's no question about it. When you look at the number of mechanisms by which taurine is involved, taurine is an absolutely critical, critical nutrient for optimal human health at a very young age when we're talking about development all the way up to when we're looking at an adult age where we can't synthesize enough of this. And so that means we absolutely need to be getting this in through our diet if we want to optimize our liver function, if we want to optimize our neurological function, keep us under a more more balanced, lower stress state in a world that seems to be just constantly throwing stressful items at us. This is going to be something you can use to support that with. And when we start to think about uh, ultimately supporting our immune system, again, that's a unique role. Don't don't forget that aspect of, of uh, how this can benefit your immune system and offset cardiovascular dysfunction as well. So guys, I, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, I know that this is a, a very you know, maybe you look at this from a scientific standpoint, you think, gosh, taurine is such a simplistic amino acid. It is, but it's such a valuable amino acid, and uh, it's one that we certainly don't want to be overlooking. Hey, guys, if you are looking for grass-fed and grass-finished beef, if you're looking for pastured poultry, uh, free-range eggs for chickens and ducks, hey, check out Harvest Hills Ranch. You can go to harvesthillsranch.com and see the work that we do out here, how we use regenerative agricultural principles to, to really drive nutrition into the food, food products that we produce, and we do it with intention. We 
do it with the mindset of all the things that I've brought to you in this video and other videos. Those are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm looking at making management decisions of how to improve, constantly improve the health of our herd and our flocks and also what that ultimately means to you as the end consumer. If you're interested in the work that I do on the clinic side, just want to see what we're all about here in terms of how I help patients, how I use the concepts that we've talked about, again, in this video and others, go to DrArlandHill.com. There's information there that I think you'll find informative and interesting and probably want to go back and, and uh, look more up. And to that end point, it wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be doing justice if, if I didn't say, hey, if you're interested in this content, if you like the content, subscribe to the channel. I'd love to continue to share this information with you and teach you ways that you can use your diet and the foods that you choose in your diet to ultimately build your health and the health of your family. So until our next conversation, guys, I'm Dr. Arlen Hill. Take care. We'll see you soon.